Greetings everyone and uh, welcome to the 54th session of the online Optom Learning series. Do let me introduce to you the speaker for today. Today we have Optom Pritam Datta. Uh, Optom Pritam has uh, finished his Masters in Optometry from the Shankara Netralaya Chennai. He is currently working as a lecturer at the Ridley College of Optometry, Assam. His research interests include areas such as visual psychophysics, binocular vision, and neurorehabilitation. He has also presented scientific papers and posters in various national as well as international optom optometry and ophthalmological conferences. And today he is going to talk to us about uh, traumatic brain injury. What are the visual consequences? And probably he's going to touch upon how you're going to manage uh, patients in terms of uh, if you have any patients uh, with traumatic brain injury. So welcome Pritam to our uh, platform, OLS. And uh, I would leave the screen time to you now. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Fakuruddin sir. So at the very beginning, uh, thank you to the team of OLS and especially Fakuruddin sir for being involved with this session since last one month with all the preparation being engaged with. And uh, without much delay, as everyone has come to know that we'll be discussing something on the visual consequences of uh, the traumatic brain injury. So let's move on into the depth of the topic. So the TBI, which we uh, which we generally call as the traumatic brain injury is a global public health concern all over the world. And if you look at the incidence rate uh, globally, like it looks like this, like the higher color shows here the maximum number of incidents and the lower, uh, you know, the uh, lower color shows the minimum number of incidents. It varies from the places to the uh, from places to places around the world. OK, that tells you the severity and the global, uh, you know, uh, the inc incidence rate of the TBI all over the world. Okay, but especially if you talk about the mild TBI, which is known to cause the maximum ocular uh, consequences because the moderate or, or, you know, the severe TBIs would have a different uh, uh, disabilities associated with the ocular one. But especially if you talk about the mild TBIs, though those uh, uh, conditions are known to have a major ocular consequences in which the optometric management plays a major role. So if you look at the incidence of the mild TBI, so you would see that uh, the overall incidence is around 302 per 1 lakh persons. And then if you look at the number of uh, populations getting affected in case of mild TBI, uh, uh, and the evidence says that most of the mild TBIs occurs in between the teenagers of 16 to 20 years of age. But if you look into the Indian scenario of TBI, it says the Indian Head Injury Foundation says that 60% of all their TBIs are caused by road traffic accidents, of which the fatality rate uh, accounts for 70 per 10,000 vehicles. But what about the mild TBI scenario in India? So the mild TBI epidemiological studies are like uh, very much limited in Indian scenario, and like there are very limited studies that have actually talked about the prevalence or you know the incidence, any or any kind of epidemiological data of mild TBI. That puts into a challenges for an optometrist to know to understand what are the visual consequences or how many patients are actually suffering from a post TBI related symptoms. Okay, so when you go to the definition of TBI, the American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicines described TBI something as traumatically induced physiological disruption of brain function, which can be, uh, you know, triggered uh, by the loss of consciousness or any kind of, you know, uh, memory loss the, after the incidents. So when you classify the TBI, uh, we usually have it, uh, you know, a classification done on the standard basis that is the mild, moderate and severe. So we grade them as per the standard norms that is being used globally. That is the uh, uh, Glasgow coma scale, the loss of consciousness scale and the post traumatic amnesia, the alternation of consciousness scale. And depending upon the characteristics being included, we, we usually classify them as the mild, moderate and severe TBIs. So these are the most commonest causes known to, uh, you know, known to lead a mild TBI, which include a blow to the head, the penetration of the skull, or any kind of blast exposure uh, injury, or the road traffic accident, any falls, or the sports-related concussions. So all these causes or etiological factors have an impact, secondary impact onto the visual systems, which we'll be discussing in the further slides. 
so why is it important to understand the uh, the you know the cross anatomy or the brain functions in case of tbi because uh, we all know that the brain is a complex structures and like many neurons and uh, uh, like various parts of the brain being involved in the visual processing we also know that the occipital lobe Uh, serves as the mainstream for the visual functions, but apart from the occipital lobe, for example, see if you are looking at the stimulus, particular stimulus, the pons of the brainstem actually work, uh, you know, actually uh, trigger the eye muscles or the associated uh, ocular uh, structures to actually see the particular objects, and ultimately the information is being passed to the retina, then optic nerve, and so on. Okay, so once it reaches the occipital lobe and the image. on i mean it is being perceived you need to actually uh, uh you know process that image uh, perceptions okay so the parietal lobe and temporal lobe actually does that so the parieto temporal lobe also has an secondary functions in visual uh, processing which helps in visual perception as well as visual memory to what actually we have seen okay so uh, what happens in tbi is like uh, there occurs a sort of diffuse axonal injury so the axons are actually the thin lining which carries the uh, nerve impulses from one neuron to the other neurons okay so in case of mild tbi it is seen that the actual injury occurs in the white and gray matter junction of which there are there are some diffuse axonal losses of uh, because of which because of the trauma the axons get you know torn or sheared or uh, you know uh, that get disrupted and because of which we have a visual consequences of which the oculomotor and non oculomotor pr problems plays a major role so the basic or or you would say the most common is uh, uh, symptoms following a uh, mind tbi uh, that involves the asnopic symptom which we are really aware of and other than asnopia there are also some non asnopic symptom which include the increased sensitivity to visual motions say a uh, short term memory loss or you know the difficulty in judging the distances of a object that the patient is actually perceiving a difficulty in some global scanning that the patient actually does So when you talk about the uh, concept of mild TBI, you need to actually understand uh, the the full the entire consequences of mild TBI, so that you can just justify them with the ocular and the non-ocular uh, complaints. Okay, so. Uh, Well, the evidence uh, proposed by Kufrida et al. says that you know there are four basic conceptual model, or you would say that the four basic triad that is involved in approaching a patient with mild TBI. Okay, that includes the basic eye examination, which include the vision, visual status of the patient, the refractive status of the patient, the oculomotor base problems, and the non-oculomotor base problem, and how to approach them and you know manage them. That we'll be discussing in the further slides, and the non-vision base problem. Yes, so in the further slides, we will be mostly dealing with these two components uh, of which the uh, you know the topic is all about. So moving on to the first phase of the visual consequences and the oculomotor uh, related issues, that is accommodation. So we all are familiar with the term accommodation out here. So how is it different uh, in case of mild TBI? so as we all know when the defocus blur occurs you know the retinal cones is stimulated and then uh, the the blur signal which we which we actually perceives sends the information towards the magnocellular layer that is the m cells of the lateral geniculate nucleus and then the summated uh, informations are collected or you know the process via the contrast related neurons and it goes to the parieto temporal areas where the image is actually perceived and then uh, we we usually memory keep keep in uh, you know uh, our memory function to the visual stimulus actually works out there okay and then when it uh, after the parieto temporal lobe it actually goes to the midbrain and the oculomotor nucleus as well as the edinger westphal nucleus where the motor command actually started working so when the motor command started working it goes to the ciliary muscles the oculomotor th th the third nerve nucleus and the ciliary ganglion the short ciliary nerve and then we as usual we know that the changes in the contraction of ciliary muscles as well as the uh, the lens changes which which generally occurs in cases of accommodation would work so what does evidence says about the role of accommodation in mild tbi 
so there is a stronger evidence of presence of accommodative insufficiency in cases of mild tbi uh, and they they hypothesize that the entire system or the entire pathway which is being involved with the accommodation is actually hampered in mild tbi and there are also uh, you know the the accommodative insufficiency is like mostly diagnosed with with the standard criteria in uh, most of the studies like uh, you know the poorer amplitude of accommodation with the patient age and like difficulty with the uh, stimulation of the accommodation that is with the minus lenses and then uh, there is an increased lag of accommodation for the patient there are also evidence but uh, you know uh, coming up in this uh, coming up recently which talks about accommodative in facility and spasm of accommodation uh, being present with or being associated with mild tbis the accommodative in facility is like we all know that the patient would have a difficulty in stimulating as well as in relaxing the accommodations likewise the spasm the spasm of accommodation is something that the patient actually exerts more, more accommodation to, uh, as per the norms to the particular to the particular age of the patients okay so these are uh, some evolving uh, you know the recent studies or you would say the recent upcoming uh, case reports where you would see that there are also uh, you know the uh, association of the accommodative in facility or the spasm in case in case of accommodative related disorders in mild tbis okay similarly when you talk about the versions uh, you would see that uh, like you would see that uh, most there is a stronger evidence of the presence of convergence insufficiency in mild tbi populations so why convergence insufficiency or why is the convergence network actually uh, getting disturbed in mild tbi so as i say that uh, the the tbi or the mild tbi is basically uh, associated with diffuse axonal injury because of which there occurs some sharing and sheeting of the axons and the information which is being processed out by the axons actually it does not reach the or you know the accurate amount percentage of the information does not reach the uh, uh, the triggering neurons you know which which helps the firing rate to a particular stimulus in producing a accommodation of versions okay so when the uh, firing rate of the neurons get decreased there the 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 versions demand or the versions amplitude would get less and out there because the patient or you know the neurons should not produce the amount of uh, uh, versions to the particular st stimulus being presented and thus ultimately lead to deficiency of the convergence network and ultimately hampering the convergence amplitude and there is a stronger evidence that yes the ci is most related with mild tbis and you know most are being diagnosed with the uh, with the signs of reduced uh, convergence amplitude as well as reduced fusional uh, the positive fusional uh, ability okay so there are also uh, also diagnosis made for the ci with unclassified versions anomalies like you know the c uh, convergence axis or you know on the divergence axis something like that but those have a very uh, lesser evidence and you know uh, like most of the studies always talks about the convergence insufficiency being present or you know more, the most commonest condition that you would see in cases of mild tbis so moving on to the neural control of saccade so why is it important to understand the eye movements at this uh, for the mild tbi especially so uh, we all know the saccades and the percades are the two different eye movement that is being engaged for every patient while leading a particular target okay so when you talk about the neural control of the saccades we all know that the when the patient uh, uh, is presented with a stimulus of the saccadic target so the ultimate process uh, you know occurs at the brain level so the uh, pontine reticular formation or you know the mesencephalic reticular formation the superior colliculus being engaged with that the frontal field also plays a major role in generating the saccades and the persists of the patients okay so what happens there when when there is a disturbance in the flow of the information being processed so you would see that the saccades or the perset is being hampered for the patient okay since all these structures plays a major role in in the information processing towards to a particular stimulus being given to the patient and generating that particular saccades okay so ultimately it is affecting uh, the eye movement of the patient in case of mild tbis 
So there are studies or, you know, there are evidence present which actually talk about the eye movements in TBIs. And, uh, you know, what does the studies actually say? They usually had measured the eye movements using an infrared technique called the visagraph, which, which is nothing but, you know, the, the, the goggles which contain an infrared chips, which actually tracks the eye movement while the patient being asked to read a target or, you know, read a paragraph or any text. So the, the instrument actually measures the fixations that is a forward saccades, you know, the patient would, uh, while the patient being, uh, you know, fixating at a particular target in a forward direction and the regression is nothing but again the backward saccades. He had already read the target but again he shifted back and again being the target is the regressions. The fixation duration is something that is the, the, the period for the, 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 the period for how long the patient is actually seeing the target, uh, uh, seeing the particular target. The reading rate is something that is the words per minute, how fast the patient can read the, ta read the words given to him without any mistake. The grade level equivalent and the comprehension are the two unique uh, parameters that the, that the instrument actually measures. So what did the uh, you know, studies actually found about the TBI in, in case of eye movements? So there are evidence which says about, you know, increased number of fixations and regressions being present in TBIs. And ultimately, uh, you know, the, there occurs some reduction in the reading rate, the comprehension and the grade level equivalent. Okay. So what we were talking about was the eye movement parameters in like, you know, calculation for the MTBI population in the evidence. So what did they actually find out? that the the fixation and the regression in the uh, you know in the uh, tbi population was kind of lessened you know it was it was it was kind of more they, they generated more fixation and the more regression as well as there was a reduction in the in the reading rate reading performance of the of the mtbi population as well as the reduction in the comprehension and the grade level equivalent in tbi population when they were compared to the non you know the non TBI related population that were the normals. Okay, and they have uh, actually uh, for the hypothesis that there occurs is some kind of hypometric saccades of the in the TBI population because of which they try to adjust the normal saccades and ultimately leading up and you know, ending up to more number of fixations and regressions. And ultimately, in results, it affects the reading performance, the reading rate, comprehension, and the grade level equivalent of the TBI individuals. Apart from the uh, dynamic testing, you can also opt for the, uh, the manual saccadic testings uh, based on the NSUCO, that is the Northeastern College University of uh, Optometry. And then it actually measures the saccades and the persists, and you can just, uh, the, the, uh, it is a clinical related method and the clinician would actually measure it subjectively. And then uh, based, based on the ability, accuracy and the head and eye movement, uh, function of the patient, you just uh, grade the patient and know, understand the severity of, you know, the, the eye movement, uh, whether it is actually the normal or whether it is abnormal. Similarly, you can also opt for the developmental eye movement testing, which actually uh, justifies and, you know, measures the oculomotor dysfunctions based on the horizontal and the vertical readings and the, the ratio that is the the horizontal time taken to read the test as well as the vertical time taken to read the ratio between them uh, would tell you the the uh, whether the the synchronization of the vertical and the horizontal reading time is accurate or whether it is being affected because of the tbi so um, uh, after the uh, assessment of the oculomotor dysfunction, the main key sign is that you would just look for any kind of oculomotor dysfunction that would include a reduction in the accommodative amplitude, an increased lag of accommodation, a slower in the facility, or you know the lesser number of eye movements and uh, you know poor performance in the visa graph or dynamic eye movement testings. Okay, let's move on to a poll now. After this uh, oculomotor part being discussed. So I would just uh, get to understand the most common is oculomotor anomalies that is being, uh, you know, uh, involved following a mild TBI populations. So almost like maximum of the participants has uh, got it correct. The conversion insufficiency, which is actually known to be the most commonest uh, oculomotor anomalies being involved with the mild TBI populations. There are also evidence like I, as I have spoken about the, the accommodative insufficiency, but it was not in the options. So it, like most of them have got it correct.
Okay, so uh, once we are diagnosed uh, with the uh, ocular motor conditions, just uh, we need to actually understand the, what is the optometric role of management in managing those cases. Okay, so when you talk about the ocular motor rehabilitation, so what does the evidence actually talks about the ocular motor rehabilitations uh, in ocular motor dysfunctions? Okay, so this is the paper which talks about the virgin's responsivity and the in you know the association and the involvement of ocular motor rehabilitation in mild TBIs and what they have actually uh, found is that is that uh, the the near point of convergence okay the convergence amplitude which is mainly used for diagnosing the you know one of the factor for convergence insufficiency was found to be improved you know uh, the convergence amplitude is actually improved after a rehabilitation ocular motor rehabilitation and then if you look at the facility uh, graph over here you could see that the post ocular motor rehabilitation the facility would be improved in those patients okay so if you all uh, look at the overall performance of the versions uh, following a ocular motor rehabilitation you would see that there is an improvement that has uh, occurred in the uh, convergence amplitude the fusional versions is the facility as well as the improvement in the CISS score as well as the visual search and attentional testings okay so all this uh, improvement gives you a question that what, how exactly uh, the the improvement occurs in case of mild tbi so it is being postulated in the researchers that uh, you have the neurons and you have the firing rate of the exon uh, neurons out there which respond to a particular stimuli so when you stimulate that particular area for a longer period okay so the neurons actually respond to that stimuli with increase in the firing rate and thus the improvement occurs okay so this is the act the, this is the theory in which the evidence have postulated until now there are several other theories which also talks about uh, you know the neuroplasty the neuroplasty of the brain but yes all these mechanisms occurs uh, you know uh, consequently with each other the next paper again it would the same group has also investigated about the accumulative response in the mild tbi and the effect of the ocular motor rehabilitation where they have found that the facility accumulative facility and the amplitude have uh, you know shown a uh, shown a greater results they have also uh, tried uh, finding out the correlation between the CISS score and the binocular amplitude of accommodation where in where they found that the, the CISS score gradually decreases with the improvement being noted in the amplitude of accommodation part. Similarly, uh, there are studies which have also investigated the reading performance and his enhancement following an oculomotor rehabilitation. And then if you look at the graph out here, you would see that the reading rate uh, uh, was actually improved for the TBI population with reading dysfunction in mild TBI. Along with the reading rate, the fixations and the grade level efficiency was also found to be uh, un con under control following an oculomotor rehabilitation. Okay, so this gives you a uh, overall uh, idea like how actually the oculomotor rehabilitation works and how it could help the patient with any kind of oculomotor uh, anomalies, be it be a conversions, be it aversions, or you know, any kind of rating deficit uh, following an oculomotor dysfunctions. Okay, so uh, we are done with the oculomotor part of the, uh, you know, visual consequences in MTBI. Let's move on to the non-oculomotor based visual problem. So it also plays a major role for, uh, for an optometrist or, you know, for an eye care professional to understand the exact etiology of the non-oculomotor based visual problems and, like, you, know, you know, managing those cases. Okay, so... I would just go with the poll to first before start beginning the non-oculomotor symptoms. Like, do you think that the measuring of dynamics of pupil would make sense in mild TBIs? So again, it was correct. Like, uh, like uh, it, it makes sense to measure the dynamics of the pupil, like because it, we all are talking about the TBIs and it is mostly neurolog uh, neurological condition. And you know, the any kind of uh, neurobase oculomotor problem or neurobase ocular problem has a secondary impact on the pupils. Okay, so it is very much important to uh, measure the dynamics of pupil. Uh, I would say in the further slide, why do we need to actually measure the dynamics of the pupil? Okay, so moving on to uh, the non oculomotor based problem. Yeah, the non-ocular motor brace problem generally consists of the photosensitivity. So the evidence says that most of the, you know, the 50% of the traumatic brain injury individuals would end up with photosensitivity. And like most of the patient also uh, uh, in the literature, it has been found that most of the patient uh, feels that the severity of the photosensitivity lies the same within the first year of injury and gradually decreases towards the second year, uh, second year of injury, even, even if the management or, you know, proper management was not being... Uh, given to the patients okay so it is very much 
I uh, difficult to comment at this moment. Like, what, how was how would be the severity of photosensitivity uh, in the patient with mild TBI following a T, uh, following a brain insult in the following years? Okay, so. Uh, let's move on to what evidence actually talks about the photosensitivity in mild TBIs. Okay, so the the majority of studies talks about the you know the the patient uh, symptoms following an injury and try to find out the frequency of the photosensitive patient with mTBI. But this particular study actually find out something very uh, uh, you know innovative. That is, they try to find out the peculiar dynamics in photosensitive patients with mild TBIs, and uh, you know they compare that with the age match control. And what they actually find out is that they find that the photosensitive patient with MTBI actually had exhibit a higher, you know, larger, larger pupils with maximum dilation velocity when compared to the controls. And uh, like they postulated that it is the it is the reason because of which you know the light entering to the eye is maximum and because of which the patient would end up with photosensitivity. They also postulated the different, uh, you know, uh, the different concept. Okay, that is the involvement of the intrinsic photoreceptor retinal ganglion cells which are known to you know process the overall information of the environment that the patient is being dealing with okay they say that the iprgc's does not actually work in case of my tbis and because of which instead of the constriction uh, instead of the constriction the eye actually gets dilated you know so in a normal torsi examination we couldn't find that but when you measure the dynamics of the pupil to understand the each and every uh, you know velocities of or uh, each and every parameters of the pupil then you would you just it would just make sense in seeing the actual changes in the velocities okay so they have found that a maximum dilation velocity is maximum in case of mild tbi with photosensitive patients when compared to the age match control without photosensitivity and tbis okay so they have also proposed a, a mechanism which tells about uh, you know to better understanding about the concept of photosensitivity where they say that the neural perception gain in the cortical tract when it is getting affected it leads to actual uh, it actually leads to the increased sensation to light and the patient would end up with photosensitivity so now the questions come what about the what about treating this patient with photosensitivity in mtbi so whether we can give a normal tinted glasses or is there something specific that that it should be prescribed for this patient so there are studies going on and you know just 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 for a sum up like i would say that most of the studies or the fewer studies which talks about photosensitivity in my tbi I found that the ifl41 lenses which actually performs better in case of photosensitive in, in case of reducing the photosensitivity as it is known to cause uh, you know uh, known to block the 80% of the blue light that the patient would be triggering uh, with uh, because uh, and leading to photosensitivity so fl41 lenses are the current research researches uh, you know that is being involved with the photosensitivity in my tbis okay so moving on to the next uh, non visual motor uh, ocular motor uh, conditions in my tbi that is the vestibular dysfunctions okay the vestibular dysfunction is again that we know that the vestibular system is is actually making a sense uh, to a rotational movement of the head or the linear movement of the head so whenever the disturbances in the vestibular uh, fun uh, vestibular function occur it leads to a vestibular dysfunction and the patient would end up with visual motion sensitivity giddiness dizziness or any kind of vertigo so in approaching how to approach them like we you know we don't uh, actually had a standard means of testing for the vestibular dysfunction at the very beginning but there are inventory tools which actually help us to understand the severity of the defects or you know severity of the problems they are facing so we have the dizziness handicap inventory tool which consists of 25 questions and then it, it actually helps the patients uh, it helps the clinician to understand the patient's problem or the patient's severity based on the dizziness okay so it actually consists of like 25 questions and then the abc scale that is the activity specific balance confidence scale it actually measures the severity or the problem that the patient faces with mtbi with vestibular dysfunction with any kind of balance issues there are also questionnaires called the vertigo visual vertigo analog scale which actually determines the the ocular or the symptoms of the patient the severity of the symptoms of the patient with vertigo following in vestibular dysfunctions but when you look about when you talk about the evidence like what does the evidence actually talks about the vestibular dysfunction in mtbi they see that, that there is an involvement in the central vestibular vestibular dysfunction the central vestibular system actually consists of the cerebellum the the vestibular nuclei so which actually helps in you know controlling the 
motion to which we actually see and because there is a dysfunction occurring at the central vestibular system the patient would end up with any kind of hand eye coordination defect any kind of balance issues in then visual motion sensitivity okay so uh, okay so uh, now the questions come about the managing those vestibular dysfunction so what is our role in managing those cases okay so as i mentioned that most of the patient would end up with visual motion sensitivity hand eye poor hand eye coordination we can actually work on stimulating or improving the hand eye coordination by the computerized means of you know improving the hand eye coordination or by some manual exercises and then we can also offer you know balance related issues giving a balance sport uh, sort of vision therapies in which the or, or you know sort of task in which the patient need to work being keeping the balance in regards so this there is some evolving conditions or evolving researches that has come up with the vestibular dysfunction management uh, uh, era and then the optometrist role in those okay so the next one would be the abnormal special uh, localization so a special sense is something you know that means the organisms you know establishes a, a stable and a constant relationship with the surroundings okay it consists of two special uh, 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 part that is the orientation and localization the orientation is something that is the information needed to know where we are uh, actually with respect to the environment and the localization is something the information needed to know where the objects are with the respect to the individuals okay so it has again the two subtypes that is oculocentric and the egocentric so the oculocentric is again the eye based mechanism which which is nothing but when the fovea is at the center to the particular object okay but the egocentric is the body based okay so what happens here is the perception of straight being seeing the object as straight would not be straight it would be shifted to a several degree because the patient would uh, refer you know uh, it would refer the object object space with reference to the body not with the reference to his fovea okay so what happens in traumatic brain injury i would not say it as tbi but you know in most of the cases with acquired brain injury you would see most cases of abnormal special localization uh, so what happens here is the egocentric localization occurs and you know because the the brain areas are disrupted by uh, by the injury and mostly you would see in the cases of the right posterior parietal cortex so ultimately it would it would end up with you know the west the um, visual midline shift syndrome where you would see the patient would not have his midline to towards the normal okay and then uh, it produces a clue conflict between the objects in which the patient is perceiving and again it would lead to an poor uh, balance issues or you know any kind of hand eye coordination problem because of the abnormal space that the patient is being perceived so uh, the yog prisms are known to be very much effective in case of abnormal special localization where uh, where, you know, where they produce a shift of the images and the patient being you know actually benefit uh, benefiting them with the help of the yog prism as a source of optometric management moving on to the last uh, you know the most uh, common of visual dis uh, disturbances following a mild tbi or you know following a tbi so uh, the visual field actually so uh, the visual field also plays an important role in tbi and you know the evidence says that most of the uh, most of the visual field defects are associated with the scattered defects apart from the homonymous myopia or restricted visual field in my, in tbis but when you look about specifically in mild tbi so this is this is the particular study which actually talked about the visual field dysfunctions in mild tbi in in the you know blast and non blast related tbi so what actually they have found is that again the same that the scattered visual field defect is the most prevalent or most commonest uh, visual field defect that you would see following a concussions uh, and you know the the homonymous hemian anopia or any restricted field that are being involved with uh, the acquired brain injury especially when there is a lesion in the uh, in the optic radiation or posterior to the optic tract then you would you would get a uh, you would get a visual field being limited to a particular side that is the homonymous hemianopia and then in cases of uh, any restricted field we all know that the field expanders or your the yog prism would work well for the patients okay so a a, a thorough ocular examination with the with a prism adaptation be given to the patient the amount of adaptation the the patient would experience the shift actually experience the shift for the distance and for the near that would be very much beneficial for the patient in case of any restricted visual field defect but when there is a scattered visual field defect the patient need not worry because it can 
time it may be because of the the sensitivity to the uh, to the threshold being presented in the visual field examination to which the patient is not actually prone to so uh, just uh, just for a summation like when we are uh, to the assessment for mild tbis or to the tbi population so when you have a population with tbis then uh, just have a history taken thorough history taken for them the understand the type of trauma the relevant history associated with the uh, with the trauma classify the tbi based on the scale that i have talked about in the previous slides after that go for a comprehensive eye examination look for the ocular structures and you know uh, have a refraction done uh, go for a uh, you know extraocular motility testing to see whether whether if the patient is having any kind of uh, extraocular motility defect uh, test for the contrast the slit film examination and the fundus examination move on to the ocular motor assessment where you go for the sensory testing the motor testing and the accommodation which we generally do the amplitude of accommodation the facilities the convergence testing no understanding the concept of the convergence amplitude the fusion of the patient and then the reading movements okay so as i have explained about the importance of understanding or assessing the uh, the saccades and the percies you can also opt for the manual uh, related assessment as well as the dynamic assessment with the with the help of and uh, you know the modified instruments such as visa graph or ritalizer apart from those you can also opt for the additional testings which you can actually uh, actually undergo that is a visual field if the patient actually complains or you might think the patient is associate the, the complaints are associated with a uh, kind of visual field always have a confrontation testing done for the patient you can also opt for the 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 humphrey field analyzer to understand the actual visual field defect go for the visual neglect test uh, or any kind of midline shape if the patient has an abnormal special localized the vestibular ocular reflex test would help you to understand uh, you know the the severity of the vestibular uh, functions okay so if the patient has got some vestibular dysfunction then obviously uh, the vestibular ocular reflex would tell you or you know would give you would give you an idea about the vestibular ocular uh, uh vestibular ocular means of the patient that following a following a tibia whether it was disturbed or whether it is in the normal position so uh apart from the normal testing there are also evidence coming out now with the advanced means of approaching a patients with tbi okay so uh, what does the advanced means of approaching tbi actually means okay so so the kufrida and uh, at all uh, we have been you know consistently involved with research with mtbis uh, from since decades and they have actually come up with a newer testing methods and which talks about you know the advanced diagnostic sensory and motor testing in mtbis so Uh, the advanced uh, diagnostic sensory testing uh, which which has been proposed by them include the visual evoke potential which we know that it actually measures the functional vision of the patient uh, getting the response from the visual cortex and the striae cortex of the occipital gyrus and what specific changes in mild tbi that they have actually found they found that the wave pattern or the amplitude of the visual evoke potential was not that adequate you know the, it was kind of amplitude was reduced in in case of mtbi population and and then there are research is going on to see how uh, what what are the source of management that could bring out the improvement in the amplitude and recently the studies have found that the binasal occlusions okay so uh, the binasal occlusions are nothing but they are used to treat the uh, the visual motion sensitivity following a vestibular dysfunction of the patient with tbi so what does a binasal occlusion do is it it actually uh, you know uh, we actually occlude the binasal side of the patient in a over a spectacle and then it says that it it proposes a two theory actually it says that the inhibition of the hyper excitability of the neuron which is actually uh, known to cause the uh, visual motion sensitivity is actually reduced with the help of binasal occlusion the another school of thoughts are you know and they say that uh, you know it is it is all about the visual attention okay so when when you block the nasal side of the visual field the temporal retina does not work out there and you would you would limit the information the unwanted information to of the peripheral retina because of which the patients uh, the magnus m cells and the t p cells would work adequately and the patient would be benefited from the visual motion sensitivity and actually with the help of visual motion sensitivity it actually makes sense of improvement in the amplitude 
attitude being noted with the visual evoke potential in in their studies the glare sensitivity is again another uh, method of testing and you should understand uh, whether the patient has any kind of glare being being present following the injury approach the patient and then uh, it is said that the glare actually occurs because of the hyper uh, excitability of the neurons at the brain level and uh, the colorimetric uh, initiative colorimetric is something very new the perceptual testing or uh, in the patient uh, visual perception with the help of the color so it is said that the fewer colors or you know the tints which which they use were the NL41 or the Omega lenses that they found that this particular lenses have an impact or have a reduction in the patient with photosensitivity or glare associated with mild TBIs. And they actually found that, you know, this, this particular lenses or this particular tint have a uh, uh, actually reduces the hyper excitability levels and then bring the neurons levels under control. Okay, the M cells and P cells would actually work with this particular uh, things, uh, the neural aspects of the theory of the colorimetry. Okay, the perceptual testing is again a very important testing to understand the uh, the mild TBS and its associated symptoms because apart from the vision, it is all about the visual perceptions um, that, that the patients or you know that the clinician needs to understand about the patient. So, uh, so. So, you know, the, it actually tests the visual memory, the sequential memory, the special discrimination of the patients, you know. So these are some uh, newer um, mode of testing, sensory testing in mild TBI, which will, which will be, you know, be getting patented in the next few years and, you know, we'll be using those in our general clinics too. So uh, moving on to the advanced diagnostic motor testing. So the same group have also proposed about the dynamic eye movement eye movement uh, testings uh, like kind of uh, the accommodation versions and the pupils since three of them are engaged with as a as a near trite so any stimulus being presented to them would, would the three system would respond simultaneously so it is very much important to understand the dynamic uh, aspects of those uh, uh, try it because you know the dynamic of accommodation would basically uh, help us to understand the exact peak velocity of accommodation to a particular stimulus being presented to the patient along with the uh, reaction time and the latency of the you know the latency to which the patient actually responded the Pupil, again, the dynamics of pupil is very much important because it plays a major role in, in producing the accommodation, photosensitivity, uh, you know, the kind of uh, photosensitivity to the patient following a TBI. So the pupil, dynamic pupil actually measures the velocities of the uh, pupillary measurements, the constriction velocity, the dilation velocities, the recovery rate, the latencies, everything. Okay, so this would help us. And, you know, few few studies have also come up with a biomarker pink set with the help of the dynamic measurements for the MTBI population. Populations. The reading eye movements, again, I have already explained about that in the, uh, in the previous section about the readalyzer and the visa graph, which actually, uh, which, uh, which actually measures the various eye movement parameters from the fixation, regressions, uh, you know, the, the oblique saccades, the, the reading rate comprehension and, you know, I, uh, the, uh, the grade level equivalent. So the, uh, the next one would be uh, is the eye hand reaction time, which is nothing but the patient's or the individual's reaction to a particular stimulus being shown. Okay, the eye hand reaction time would give you an idea of how the patient vestibular ocular vestibular ocular system is actually working out there. So if the patient is a normal uh, normal one and does not have any vestibular ocular or you know or the special uh, orientation problem he would have a normal reaction time but if he has certain problem the eye hand coordination would actually not work and ultimately lead to abnormal eye hand reaction time the dynamic posture graphy is something not being used in the optometric practice but yes uh, just for a basic understanding as postulated by them as one of the diagnostic motor testings okay so the dynamic posture graphy i would show the picture out here so the dynamic posture graphy would actually measure you know is known to uh, as a computerized dynamic post, uh, test which uh, patient which measures the patient balance control in situation intended to isolate the factors uh, that affect the balance in everyday experience okay so uh, we all know the maintenance of the balance is a complex physiological uh, process which requires an interaction of the vestibular the visual proprioceptive and somatosensory uh, somato systems as well as the central reflex system so any
imbalances uh, in this system will lead to a balance issues and this particular instrument measures the object objective quantitative analysis of the of the balance that the patient uh, would, would be measuring okay so it, it has a certain test protocols in which actually it measures whether the patient posture or whether the patient balance with the severity of target or severity of task being given to the patient is normal or abnormal okay so this picture the second picture also tells you about the dynamic eye movement testing so in this picture you would see that the right sided image is the is the correct perceived movement that the patient would actually make okay the circular one the 360 degree uh, smooth perceived movement that the patient exhibit in the normal pattern but if you move on to the left sided image out here you will see a pattern of defective perceives being present okay so the 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 newer instrument also tracks the eye movement to a following direction so it actually presents a stimulus uh, in a smooth perceived way so the so that the perceived system would actually work and then it actually uh, gives out an output like this where you could see the patient perceived it's actually adequate or not Going on to the last slide is like the sort of mini just for a summary. Like uh, we have come across the oculomotor grid. Actually, patient uh, with accommodation versions as well as uh, uh, during deficit. The tinted glasses would work in a patients with a uh, with photosensitivity or any kind of visual motion sensitivity. Uh, you know the binasal occluders, as I have mentioned, that the visual motion sensitivity and how they actually work and what is the theory behind them. Uh, prisms again, the, a, any kind of visual field defect would actually work. The vestibular therapy, if you have, you have patients with vestibular dysfunctions and, uh, and the patient being uh, with a different eye and coordination problem, balance issues, and etc., then you would also go for a vestibular therapy. So it is the vestibular therapy. I would just uh, like to mention that it is not just the optometric way of management. It is a teamwork of you know the neuropsychiatrists, the uh, physiologists. Okay, okay. Uh, so all this makes a team. Okay, it's not like you have to control all of the visual system. The other systems might also have an impact. And thank you so much once again to the entire team of OLS for being uh, associated with such innovative platform. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Rita. I think it was. Uh, it, despite of the technical glitches what we had, I think it was very uh, comprehensive and I think everyone stayed back even of the technical glitches uh, which happened. So thank you very much for doing this talk. And so let's take the question, Pritam. Any role of the electrodiagnostic test, uh, ERG or uh, you know EOG, electroculogram uh, in TBI, probably yeah. for diagnosing yeah. or in the condition? Yeah. 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 So uh, as I have mentioned, like the advanced mode of, the, you know, assessing a TBI population. So I have also mentioned about the VP, which is again, the electrodiagnostic test is, uh, test. But uh, yes, uh, uh, there are studies coming up where you would again, uh, uh, you know, want to understand the retinal uh, responsivity to the particular st uh, stimulus. And yes, the electrodiagnostic would also help helping that. But for now, and for my, from my personal experience, uh, like the electrodiagnostic, I have never approached for a uh, mild TBI population because most of them would again have a, uh, you know, the association of oculomotor symptoms. The, the non-oculomotor symptoms, which we, which I have explained, would, would occur in a very few populations and would report, you know, uh, with, uh, with associated with multiple disabilities. But uh, for, for just to respond to the question, yes, there is a role of electrodiagnostic in TBI. You can also opt for the ERG or EOG uh, in, uh, in, in understanding the the retinal, uh, you know, the the retinal sensitivity to the particular stimulus being present to the patient with TBI. Okay, and how about color vision? I just saw a question popped up, so I just uh, yeah. quickly asked. Color vision, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So most of the cases, uh, like you would say that because there is uh, there is an involvement in the optic nerve or you know the brain pathology or the the various brain activities that were occurring in the mild TBIs, then. Uh, 
in case of mild tbs so, not much uh, evidence have found that the color division specific color vision defect is being present uh, to the patient but when it comes to you know the acquired brain injury uh, such as any kind of tumor removal or uh, you know any kind of stroke related things then there might be a defect in the color vision but for a case of mild tbi it does not have a significant changes in case of color vision if you if you measured it but yeah okay and just a couple of more questions uh, i think you mentioned about the visual neglect test so is there any specific test uh, somebody is asking we were brief about that test. yeah we actually actually we do perform a uh, albert's testing which is nothing but you have a straight lines all over a visual field area uh, which is done at a particular uh, 40 cm distance we ask the patient to bisect the straight line exactly at the center okay so whenever they, the patient does not have a special localization or they, the patient has an abnormal special, special localization the patient would not the patient with visual neglect you know would not particularly respond to the exact center or he would not intersect to the exact center of the line being presented okay then we got to know that which are the areas that the patient actually does not respond is actually the neglect of the patient other tests you would also go for you know the clock drawing test for the patient we ask the patient to draw a clock and number them as per how we actually see in a, a clock but when the patient have uh, has any kind of defect the patient the complete drawing of the clock would not be present for the patient so that's how we we actually uh, uh, actually see the visual neglect of the patients okay okay one last question uh, yeah is there any uh, you know the role of uh, dynamic posture test for pediatric tbi cases yeah so uh, so yeah, frankly can. speaking at this moment of time it is very much difficult to comment uh, on the dynamic posture test for especially for the pedi pediatric tbi cases because it is just an evolving uh, you know uh, evolving kind of uh, research in tbis and mostly like uh, uh, it is from a personal experience i have never tested the dynamic posture testing using a dynamic instrument you know measurement instruments but uh, hoping for some uh, you know evidence that talks about the pediatric tbi cases and measuring the dynamic posture okay and i think just let's sum it up uh, what do you think uh, could be the uh, ideal role of an optometrist in whatever setup we are let's say we are in an optical setup or an ophthalmological setup or a clinical setup uh, what should an optometrist do if they have patients with tbi just to sum it up what do you think so uh, so at first uh, we would understand the the uh, the patient having tbi by the history itself so an adequate history is very much essential so when you got to know that the patient actually has a, a history of tbi go for the uh, you know tbi related symptoms go for the oculomotor symptom non oculomotor symptom whether the patient actually uh, feels that or you know whether they actually experience that if they experience that then go for the testing if at all they don't experience and then also you have to perform some you know uh, uh, some tests like kind of sort of accommodation testing the uh, you know, the manual accommodation testing which is very much easy using an accommodative target the convergence testing understanding the versions of the patient as i uh, and also i have mentioned about you know the eye movement testing the manual movement testing not every uh, you know clinics or a hospital would have a dynamic mode of testing but then you also need to understand the the eye movements of the patient then go for the manual testing there are certain manual testing for eye movements too like kind of developmental eye movement testing the nsuco grading of saccades and the persids go for that understand the eye movements of the patient and if if the patient has you know any kind of a visual field problem go for a visual field testing done have a confrontation done so all these things can be done in a general cleaning without you know moving on to the advanced mode of diagnosis that's right that's right so i think that that's the whole idea why i asked you this question because yeah. whether you are in any setup these basic tests are always available like testing for accommodation doing a quick confrontation test uh, i think the role of optometrist is definitely there at uh, in terms of you know uh, measuring all that and testing for all that so i think we have taken almost uh, all the relevant questions thank you very much pritam for uh, doing this talk and you know i think uh, now we would be a bit confident in uh, you know uh, assessing patients uh, if we get across to tbi patients in the future so thank you thank you very much pritam thank you thank you so much sir
wanted to let you all know that we are also in a uh, preparatory series uh, of the case presentations so we are in the preparation of that so we would request if you could submit your abstracts of any unique cases which you have seen in your practice uh, we would be having a 20 minutes case presentation with 10 minutes uh, question answer this would be probably in october or november when the time and when we have enough enough abstracts to put it in a series so please go to the website uh, the details will also be emailed to you it's a small google form we need some case details and the scientific uh, committee will review the case and uh, once your case has been approved we will schedule you to present on our platform it's open for optometrists is open for all optometry students as well so we do have sessions next week until then stay home stay safe and uh, i will see you all again next week as well take care and bye bye thank you pritam bye bye thank you so much thank you so much sir bye